Hello, Facebook. Hello, YouTube. Hello, Instagram. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Hi. So, we are here at Miss Hope's Reading Hour. I am Miss Hope. I'm so glad that I was able, that I am able, excuse me, to be here with you today. So glad to be here on this marvelous Monday, right? So, how was your weekend? Hopefully, you had a great weekend. It was a nice weekend. Um, oh, I did not share this. I said I was going to share it, but I forgot. I apologize. So, I had my first real harvest of the season. Can you believe it? I harvested my first cucumber. It's about this long. When I get off of this live, I will send the picture so that you can all see. Finally, I have something from my garden. So happy. Hopefully, if you all were able to grow anything, you have been harvesting some stuff, okay? Yes, so I was really happy about that. Garden happy thing number two, okay? Garden happy thing number two. My melon is about maybe this big, maybe that big. That's how big it is now. Then I was looking and I was like, what is that hanging? It's another melon about that big. I was excited. I said, oh, shucks now. We got some more melons. Okay. So I was super excited, right? Well, that's my story about my garden. Okay. And my friends. If you had, hello, uh, Miss Eileen, so glad that you are here. Any little people who are here, any of my young ones, my older ones, my friends, my teacher friends, my parent teacher friends, so glad that you are here, okay? Well, if you are a part of the Miss Hope's Reading Hour page on Instagram, or group on Facebook, you may have seen a post this weekend. Hopefully you did. So starting this week, we will have guest readers on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. We will have guest readers. So if you have a child, if you are a child or have a child who would like to be a guest reader on Miss Hope's Reading Hour, or if you have really little ones who are watching Miss Hope's Reading Hour and you would like to share a book that is a favorite of your little one with you and your little one being the guest reader, please send me a message, make a comment, and let me know that you are interested in being a guest reader, okay? I want for um, those of you who are members of Miss Hope's Reading Hour and followers of Miss Hope's Reading Hour to come on and share your favorite books. I'm buying books all the time that I think that you guys will like. Um, I'm looking for books that you all will like, but who will best know what books you like except for you, okay? So if you have, my young ones, a book that you really like that is your favorite and you want to read it for us on Miss Hope's Reading Hour, tell your parents or your aunties or your uncles or whatever Ever adult has signed you up for Miss Hope's Reading Hour, let them know 
you know what? I think I want to go on Miss Hope's reading hour and read a book for all of the viewers, okay? And parents, parent, teacher, friends, if you have some little ones that there is a favorite book that you read at night or that you just read for fun and you want to share it with us on Miss Hope's Reading Hour, please, oh, please, oh, please send me a message and let me know that you would like to be a guest reader on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. So the guest reading days will be on Fridays, on our fabulous Friday. That is when they will be. So this fabulous Friday will be our first Friday with a guest reader, okay? So please do share that post. I will post it again for you all to let your friends who have little ones and young ones and older ones know that if they want to be a guest reader on Miss Hope's Reading Hour, come on and read on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Also, if you are a children's book author, guess what? You are welcome to come on Miss Hope's Reading Hour and read the book that you wrote. And for my young ones, let's just say there is a story that you wrote yourself. Guess where you can read it? Right here on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Okay. So there are there are options, friends. There are options. Okay. Now, let us get into the books. One more thing I have to tell you. I am excited because I have some books getting delivered to my house today. Some new books, okay? New books for all of you, okay? Now, if you want to donate to Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library, which is where the money came from to get those new books that are coming today, if you want to donate, if you are on Facebook or YouTube, you will see the little ticker going across the bottom of the page with the Cash App handle and the email address where you can send um, Amazon or any book retailer you like, you can send those gift cards to. So how can you donate? You can donate via Cash App. The Cash App handle is Hope G M H O P E G M, all one word, all lowercase. You can donate that way. Any amount that you give will be used to add books to the Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library. I have gotten so many books because of your donations. I think I'm actually going to have to buy another shelf. Okay. We have read through a lot of books. One day I'm going to count them and let you know exactly how many books we've read through. We have made some progress, friends. So how else can you donate? You can donate by emailing an email gift card, a virtual gift card, an electronic gift card from Amazon or any book retailer that you prefer. You can email it to Miss. Hopes R H at gmail.com. That's Miss Hopes R H for reading hour at gmail.com. And you can send those gift cards there. Okay. All right. Now we've gotten all of that out of the way. Let's get to what we're really here for. What are we really here for? We're really here for some books. That's what we're really here for. Okay. So Today may be a four book day, okay? I just couldn't pick which two of the three first books to read or not to read. If we get to the fourth book, we'll do it. If we don't get to the fourth book, we won't do it, 
okay? But it just might be a four book deck, okay? Now let's go through the three books that we're definitely reading. And the one classic book, it's a classic. Once you see it, you're gonna be like, I love this book, okay? The one classic book that we just might be reading before we get into the chapter book, okay? Now, our first book that we will be reading today is called Moja Means One. Swahili Counting Book by Muriel Feelings, Pictures by Tom Feelings, okay? So remember what I said in the teaser, how many ways and things are there to count? There are other ways, more than just saying one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There are other ways and other things. We will be reading books about that today. All right. Our next book is called Zin, 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 A Violin. I was trying to figure out what other books will I read this one with? So the, this book is by Lloyd Moss, illustrated by Marjorie Priceman. Zin, 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 a violin. I'm gonna keep the third one a secret, just in case. And hint, hint, our very young ones will really, really like this book. But I know older kids who still love this book. Still love it, okay? Now, and then we will end up with our belly up. So we have found out that Henry, the hippo, has kicked the bucket, but we don't know what happened. So we have to find out what happened. The story already started off like this is going to be a story, okay? <laughs> All right. So let us get into our first book. Moja means one. Swahili counting book by Muriel Feelings. Okay. All right, just a moment. Let us have some ambiance in the reading of our book, shall we? Yes, we shall. Moja means one. Snowy Kilimanjaro is the highest mountain in Africa. Mbili means two. Mankala, a counting game, is played by villagers young and old. Oh, I know so many kids who love this game. <laughs> young and old, they are not kidding around. Tatu means three. Farmers grow coffee trees in all parts of East Africa. These pictures are beautiful, even though they're in black and white. Some of my favorite pictures are just black and white. Ne means four. Mothers usually carry their babies on their backs while walking. Look at those four beautiful mothers. Tano means five. Many kinds of animals roam the grassy savanna land. It would be amazing to see an elephant. <laughs> Sita means six. The clothing East Africans wear includes the Kanga, the Busuti, the Laka, the Kanza, and Dashiki. You know, 
know, much of our fashion is inspired by these garments. Saba, the not oh Saba means seven. The Nile River, which flows between Uganda and Egypt, is filled with fish. Look at those fish. Nane means eight. Busy market stalls are stocked with fruits, vegetables, meats, fish, clothes, jewelry, pottery, and carvings. Tisa means nine. Men play drums, thumb pianos, bamboo flutes, and other instruments. Wow, they've got a whole band. All you need is nine of your closest friends. Kumi means 10. At night in villages, old people tell stories to children around the fireside. Those are the best stories to hear. When older people tell stories, they're the best. The end. So today, you learned there are more ways than one to count. You learned how to count from one to 10 in Swahili. Even if you are an older, young one. You didn't know that, did you? You learned something new. It's good to learn at least one new thing every day. So my friends, let us get to our teaser book for the day. Zin, 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 A Violin by Lloyd Moss and illustrated by Marjorie Priceman. Now, how is this book going to teach us about counting? Let's see. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hmm, zin, zin, the violin. With mournful moan and silken tone, Itself alone comes one trombone, sliding, gliding, high notes go low. One trombone is playing solo. When you're playing solo, that means you're playing by yourself. Next, a trumpet comes along and sings and stings its swinging song. It joins trombone no more alone. And one and two, they're a duo. A duo is when two people are playing music together. Fine French horn, its valves all oiled, brassy and bright, loops all coiled. Golden yellow joins its fellows, two and three of what a trio. What do you think being in a trio means? means playing with three people. Now a mellow friend, the cello. Neck extended, bows a hello. End pin set upon the floor. It makes a quartet 
that's four. Four people playing together is a quartet. And highs in soaring high and moving in with zin, zin, zin of violin. Stroking strings that come alive. Now quintet, let's count them five. In a quintet, you are playing with five people. Turn that down a little bit. There you go. Flute that sends our soul a shiver. Flute that slender, silver sliver. A place among the sets it picks to make a young sextet. That's six. <laughs> With steely keys that softly click, its breezy notes so darkly slick, a sleek black woody clarinet. It's number seven, now septet. Did you know that seven people playing together was a septet? Now you know. Gleeful, bleeding, sobbing, pleading, through its throbbing double reading. Oboe, please don't hesitate. Come, make it an octet. That's eight. Eight people playing together is an octet. That lazy clown, the big bassoon, he plays low down, we're laughing soon. Here, Grumpy, get your place in line. Give us a nonette, that's nine. I learned something new today. Nine people playing together is a nonette. The harp descends with angel wings, a heavens blend through magic strings. And when it joins the others then, behold a chamber group of 10. So I guess when 10 people are playing together, that's what they call a chamber. The orchestra comes in the hall. They're on the stage, we see them all. The cello, harp, and clarinet. The trumpet, whom we've also met. The oboe, flute, and big bassoon. All eager to get started soon. Trombone, French horn, and violin. All poised and ready, now begin. <laughs> the strings all soar, the reeds implore, the brasses roar with notes galore. It's music that we all adore. It's what we go to concerts for. The minutes fly, the music ends, and so goodbye to our new friends. But when they have bowed and left the floor, if we clap loud and shout encore, they may come out and play once more. <laughs> And that would give us great delight before we say a late good night. <laughs> the 
end. Wasn't that an awesome story? Did you know that all of those numbers in the number of people playing music together were all ways to count? Did you know that? I did not know. I have heard of a chamber orchestra, but I did not know that a chamber orchestra has 10 people. Didn't know that. So if you want to read this book again, Zin Zin Zin, a violin, especially young ones, if you are interested in music, parents and teachers, if you have students and children interested in music, this is a good one. Zin Zin Zin, a violin by Lloyd Moss. And then you can give it an encore. Encore, 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 whenever you like, okay? So, I do believe we have time for our third, third <laughs> counting book. It is a classic. Most people think, oh, it's just for little kids, like in kindergarten or something like that. But... Because so many kids love this book, even older people like to read it, okay? That's just like cartoons. You think only kids like cartoons? No! I like me a good Bugs Bunny or Tom and Jerry every now and then, okay? So our classic counting book for today Oh, look at that. I love this book. The Very Hungry Caterpillar. Mm -hmm -hmm. Classic, classic, classic by Eric Carl. So we do have time. It will be a four book day. Let us read The Very Hungry Caterpillar. In the light of the moon lay, in the light of the moon, a little egg lay on a leaf. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, somebody said they knew it. <laughs> One Sunday morning, the warm sun came up and pop out of the egg came a tiny and very hungry little caterpillar. See him there, that little guy? He started to look for some food. On Monday, he ate through one apple, but he was still very hungry. On Tuesday, he ate through two pears, but he was still very hungry. On Wednesday, he ate through three plums, but he was still very hungry. On Thursday, he ate through four strawberries, but he was still very hungry. That's a lot of fruit, man. On Friday, he ate through five oranges but he was still very hungry. On Saturday, he ate through one piece of chocolate cake, one ice cream cone, one pickle, one slice of Swiss cheese, 
one slice of salami, one lollipop, one piece of cherry pie, one sausage, one cupcake, and one slice of watermelon. That night, he had a stomach ache. I think I would have one too if I ate all of those things, even some of all of those things. The next day was Sunday again. The caterpillar ate through one nice green leaf. And after that, he felt much better. See, that's what you should be eating through, Mr. Caterpillar. You should be eating through the leaves, not all that stuff. Now he wasn't hungry anymore. And he wasn't a little caterpillar anymore. He was a big, fat caterpillar. He built a small house called a cocoon around himself. He stayed inside for more than two weeks. Then he nibbled a hole in the cocoon and pushed his way out. Look at how fat he is. Whoa. What happened when he ate his way, pushed his way out? <gasps> and he was a beautiful butterfly. Look at that. Gorgeous. <laughs> the end. So, our caterpillar friend ate, how many things did he eat in those five days? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, fifteen things. And then on Saturday, he ate one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten more things. Altogether, he ate 25 things, little piece, before a little guy. That's a lot of food. More than one way to count, right? But it all added up to him becoming a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> Classic. Every kid should have this book. I'm telling you, every kid. Okay, now my friends, to our fourth book. Are you proud that we made it to four books today? If you are, give a round of applause. Give a hand, okay? We made it to four books today. Now, two belly up by Stu Ooh, upside down <laughs> by Stuart Gibbs so far we have found out that Teddy Fitzroy is not no like the security especially large Marge is not a fan of Teddy his family lives at the zoo but while he was getting in trouble with the large march, all of that had to stop because there is a mystery. Something has happened to Henry the hippo and we must find out what happened because he is belly up in the water. All right, let us get back to belly up. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Henry, the character who takes pictures with the people, Henry staggered to his feet and reeled away drunkenly, scaring a few guests. A hand clamped on my shoulder. I spun around to find Martin Delgato glaring at me. 
Martin was the director of operations at Fun Jungle, which was an odd choice because he hated children and animals. Dad said he was supposed to be some hotshot business genius though. I could usually spot him coming from a mile away because in a park crowded with t-shirt clad tourists, he was always the one person wearing a three-piece suit. Martin was perpetually overworked and constantly appeared to be five seconds from a heart attack, but some, he somehow still found time every day to chastise me for doing something wrong. Another person? Who gave you permission to dismiss my employees, he demanded. I figured someone needed to do something, I replied, seeing as Marge has gone brain dead. Martin gave me a glare so hot I could imagine eggs frying on his bald head. Why would anyone need to dismiss the actors, he scowled. Because of what happened to Henry, I said. Martin looked at me blankly, and I realized, to my surprise, that he didn't know about Henry yet. He turned toward Mbuku Overlook and took in the stunned crowd. I guess in his haste to reprimand me, he hadn't noticed them. His anger was quickly replaced by concern. What's wrong with Henry, he asked. I'd been reading about ancient Rome the night before. Apparently, they used to kill messengers who brought bad news. You should probably see for yourself, I told him. Keeping his hands locked on my shoulders, Martin shoved through the crowd. When Marge saw him, she finally snapped out of her comatose state and pretended she was doing something important. Martin blew right past her and caught his first glimpse of Henry. He said something in Spanish. I didn't know what it meant, but I'll bet a hundred dollars it was something for which I've been sent to my room for saying in English. For maybe a half a second, Martin seemed truly saddened by Henry's death. And then his inner administrator kicked in. He immediately went into damage control mode. Go find Doc, he told me. Wherever he is, tell him to get over here ASAP. I considered pointing out it was a bit too late for the head vet to help Henry, but decided against it. Martin probably wanted to get rid of me as much as he wanted to locate Doc. Meanwhile, his attention was already on other things. He instructed Marge to get all the tourists out of there, then started barking orders into his radio. I knew better than to stick around after Martin had essentially told me to scram, but I felt compelled to take one last look at Henry. I'd seen plenty of deaths in Africa, so I wasn't that freaked out about animal corpses, but something really bothered me about this one. I'd been at Hippo River the day before and Henry had been in a rare good mood, prancing about on the river bottom, putting on a great show for the tourists. He was only 20, which was young for a hippo. He'd certainly looked healthy. It didn't make sense for him to be dead. Suddenly, Marge grabbed me by the collar, yanking me away from the overlook. Are you, what are you still doing here? She growled, trying to guess who's bigger, Henry or you. Marge's eyes narrowed in anger, but I wrenched free from her grasp before she could do anything. Then I raced off, in, raced off into Fun Jungle, leaving the corpse of the world's most famous hippopotamus behind. Chapter two, damage control. I found Doc out in Safari Land, trying to lance a boil on a warthog. This would have been a pretty easy procedure in his if his patient was a uh, if his patient had been human. A boil's really just a big pus-filled sack on the skin, sort of like a giant zit, only a lot more painful. Lancing it means popping it with a sterile needle so the pus can run out and the swelling can go down. It only takes a few seconds, but you can't explain that to a warthog. 
You can't say, if you hold still for a moment, I'll make you feel better. All the warthog knew was that it was in pain. It was angry. And the last thing it wanted to see was some guy coming at it with a big needle. For this reason, a lot of zoos vet, zoo vets would have just darted the warthog with sedative, waited for it to fall asleep, and then done the job nice and easy. But Doc wasn't like that. Mom and dad both said he was one of the top vets in the country, maybe even the best. He'd run the veterinary hospital at the prestigious Bronx Zoo before Fun Jungle had lured him away. Doc hated using sedatives because it was tricky to get the dosage exactly right. If you gave the animal too little, it might wake up in the middle of the procedure and attack you. So most people tried to err on the side of caution. The problem there was, if you gave the animal too much sedative, it might fall asleep and never wake up again. Doc didn't like people a whole lot, but he really cared about animals. He hated the thought of one of them dying for no reason. So rather than take that chance, he and two of the biggest zookeepers he could find were out in the broiling sun trying to pin down the pissed off work hog and lance it without being gored by its tusks. It didn't look like the best time to inform Doc that Henry was dead. The men had been trying to subdue the warthog for a while with no success, and Doc was in a nasty mood. But then, Doc tended to be in a nasty mood most of the time anyhow, so I figured maybe he'd be too distracted by the warthog to get angry with me for bringing bad news. Doc had just backed the warthog into a corner of its paddock when I arrived. He was a tall man, well muscled from years of overpowering animals and baked brown from the long days in the sun with a mustache so thick it looked like a woolly bear caterpillar had fallen asleep on his upper lip. He groaned when he saw me, though I didn't take it personally. Doc pretty much groaned in response to anyone approaching him. The only person he actually seemed to like was my mom. They'd met 15 years earlier when she'd done a guerrilla research apprenticeship at the Bronx Zoo. Beat it, Teddy, he snapped. I'm busy. I'm not sure what I'd ever done to earn Doc's distaste. I think merely being human was enough. Martin told me to come and get you, I said. Doc's reaction proved he liked Martin even less than me. Go tell Martin to go jump in a lake. Henry's dead, I told him. Doc and the keepers were surprised enough to take their eyes off the angry warthog. They glanced at me for a moment to confirm I wasn't making a bad joke, then quickly returned their attention to their patient before he could make a run for it. For how long? Doc asked. I don't know. Well, guess. I checked my watch. It had taken me almost 20 minutes to track Doc down. First, I'd been told he was in the swamp, then Amazon Adventure, and finally Safari Land. I'd run myself ragged looking for him. 45 minutes, an hour maybe. Any idea why the old bastard croaked? I think that's what Martin wanted to talk to you about. He wants to see you ASAP. Why? Henry's dead. It's not like he can get any worse. I don't know why. He just said to find you. Tell Martin to find a place for an autopsy and I'll be along when I can. An autopsy? For Henry? Martin's not going to like that. Doc smiled for what was probably the first time that day. No. I suspect he won't like that at all.
If it seems surprising that Doc wasn't upset by Henry's death, there was a perfectly good reason for this. Henry was the meanest zoo animal of all time. Hippos already have a reputation for being amongst the most foul-tempered members of the animal kingdom. But even keepers who had worked with hippos for years thought Henry was the nastiest one they'd ever come across. You couldn't have picked the worst animal to be the mascot of a multi-billion dollar family theme park. His selection had been a colossal screw up. To understand how it happened though, you need to know how Fun Jungle came to be. Fun Jungle had been built by the Texas billionaire, J.J. McCracken. J.J. always admitted he didn't know much about animals but he knew a heck of a lot about making money. He'd been born dirt poor in a small town not far from where Fun Jungle now sat and somehow managed to parlay a couple hundred dollars he'd won in a poker game into enough money to make him the third richest man in America. The way JJ spoke about this, it sounded like anyone could do it, but the fact was he had a gift. Whatever he invested in always made money. Dad often said that if J.J. McCracken sent his, set his money on fire the next day, burned dollars would be worth more than gold. Despite being so rich, J.J. had a reputation as a friendly, folksy guy who'd never let having money go to his head. Instead of wearing fancy suits, he preferred blue jeans and sneakers. Rather than live in some Beverly Hills mansion, he had a ranch in Texas Hill Country near his hometown. He drove a pickup truck instead of riding in a limo and preferred barbecue to sushi. I also prefer barbecue. <laughs> and whenever he was interviewed about how he thought up Fun Jungle, he inevitably gave all the credit to his 13-year-old daughter, Summer. Summer had, only, had been only six when she'd given JJ the idea. Planted the seed was how he always put it. Like most children, she loved animals. So when her dad had given her the choice of going anywhere in the world on vacation, she asked to go on safari in Africa. JJ had agreed but then learned no safari company would take any, anyone under age seven, no matter how much he was willing to pay. When he broke this news to Summer, she was devastated. Why wasn't there any place for children to go on safari in America? She'd asked. Good question, her father had replied and decided to build one. Of course, J.J. McCracken wouldn't have built Fun Jungle merely to please his daughter. No, he smelled profit. His research staff quickly discovered that zoos and aquariums attracted more than 500 million visitors in America each year, more than all sporting events combined. So then, J.J. reasoned, if he built a zoo, Impressive enough to siphon off only a fraction of those people, he'd make a mint. To lure all those tourists, however, Fun Jungle had to be more than just a zoo. It had to be a theme park as well, a place where pe a place people would be willing to cross the country to see, a place they'd visit for days on end, a place they'd want to come back to every year. J.J. declared that Fun Jungle should be a combination of the San Diego Wild Animal Park and Disney World, and then proceeded to steal ideas from each. Safari Land, for example, was directly copied from San Diego, several massive enclosures, each more than a square mile in size held hundreds of animals living together in a facsimile of the wild. There were two ways to see it. You could take a 30-minute monorail ride around the perimeter, 
or for a, an extra $100 per person, you could take a personal safari inside the enclosure. You travel in a Land Rover with a guide and only a few other people. I'd gotten to do this for free with my parents before the park opened. And I have to admit, it was darn close to going on safari in Africa. Maybe even better, because at Fun Jungle, they let you feed the rhinos apples by hand. Fun Jungle had all sorts of other attractions that other zoos didn't. They were souped, there were souped up animal exhibits like the Polar Pavilion, an indoor polar bear and penguin exhibit where it really snowed, or Blue Planet, the world's largest saltwater aquarium, featuring a man-made coral reef you could snorkel over and several pools where you could pay to swim with dolphins. There were shows where animals performed tricks, a sky ride, a carnival midway, water slides, two huge play areas for kids, Mom called them jungle gems on steroids and even a few vaguely educational thrill rides. My favorite was Life of a Bee, which used a motion simulator to put riders through the harrowing five minutes of being attacked by everything from birds to fly swatters. It was awesome. In addition to the park, JJ also planned to make money from the hotels around it which he owned. There were only two so far, although others were slated for construction and they were unlikely, they were unlike any other hotels in America. One was a safari lodge on the edge of safari land. The other was a Caribbean resort next to the Blue Planet snorkeling area. There were, they were extremely well designed Visiting each felt like going to a whole different country. Neither place was cheap, but both were booked solid for a year in advance. Okay, so we're going to stop there for the day. So my friends, we have found out that, yeah, there is no help in um, Henry now, but they have to do an autopsy. They usually do something like that to find out what happened to the hippo. Now, there's where we're going to maybe find out some of the mystery around poor Henry. And we found out a little more information about Fun Juggle and J.J. McCracken, who built it. Hmm. Let me think. What if there's someone who wants to be in competition with Mr. McCracken? So they offed the mascot, which is Henry. Hmm. 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 What if the guy who doesn't like animals, what's his name? Let's find out. See, I'm already thinking. I'm already thinking. Martin. Martin works there. He doesn't like kids and he doesn't like animals. So what if Martin did something to Henry? Mm-hmm. Already getting my mind turning on the mystery. We got to find out what happened, okay? Well, my friends, we are at the end of Miss Hope's reading hour. Can you believe it? And it was a four book day. We did four books, two books, a third one that's a classic, and we learned a little more about Fun Jungle. And later on, on Wednesday, we'll learn a little more about what we think happened to Henry. But my brain is already turning, trying to find out who did it. 
This is a who done it. We got to find out who did it. We're all probably going to be surprised. We're all going through this whole thing together. I have not read ahead. I do not know what happened. I do believe that we are all going to be surprised together. Okay. So since we are at the end of Miss Hope's reading hour, I can't believe it. Like it just goes so fast. And even with four books. Well, my friends, this is the end of our marvelous Monday of counting, finding out new ways to count with ooh, Moja means one Swahili counting book by Muriel Feelings. We can count in another language. Zen, 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 a violin by Lloyd Moss. We can count by learning the different names for a number of people playing music. We can count by figuring out how much food our little caterpillar had to eat to become a beautiful butterfly in a classic, okay? So those were our books for today. I am so happy that I got to read with you all. It's always so much fun, so much fun. Please do make comments. Do leave me a message and let me know how you are enjoying Miss Hope's Reading Hour or anything new or different that you'd like to see on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Speaking of new and different, Remember the post that I made on Fridays from now on will be our guest reader day on our fabulous Friday. So my young ones, my older young ones, my friends and teacher friends who have little ones who would like to come on with your children and read your favorite book please send me a message. I already have two. I already have two people. So if you would like to be a guest reader with your child, please send me a message, even make a comment, okay? And let me know that you are interested in being a guest reader with your child, okay? So we can get a nice lineup of guest, guest readers on our fabulous Friday, okay? All right, now, my friends, we are at the end of Miss Hope's reading hour officially. Thank you so, so, so very much for being here with me on such a marvelous Monday. This was marvelous, it was, my friends. So thank you for being here with me and sharing in these great stories until our wonderful Wednesday, okay? I will meet you right back here. Have a great Tuesday, a terrific Tuesday. And those of you who are in the South, please be careful with the tropical storm, I I'm sorry, I, I pronounced that wrong. Okay, but with the tropical storm, please be careful. For those of you who are going to be out on your terrific Tuesday, please make sure to have proper social distancing and wear a mask, okay? And have a great day tomorrow. Have a wonderful rest of your marvelous Monday, and I will meet you all right back here on a wonderful Wednesday on Miss Hope's Reading Hour at 3 p.m. Until then, bye for now. See you later, see you later, see you later, see you later.